The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello everybody. My name is Lalit Kumar Bhambai and I welcome you to State of Software Testing webinar brought to you by Tita with Testers in association with Practitest. With our startup analysts, Jay Weinberg and Theonu Charles. Well, that's going to be our agenda for tonight's session. I will be walking you through some housekeeping notes followed by panel introduction. Joel will be helping us with facilitating panel discussion and if time permits, we will have a quick question and answer round. Regarding questions, so if you have any questions, you can ask them in questions option of your GoToWebinar panel. We'll try to get your questions answered by tea time with testers in case we can't cover them in webinar because of time constraints. We'll appreciate if you can share this event live using state of testing hashtag on Twitter so that we can catch up with follow-up questions and discuss this further on Twitter. Recording of this webinar will be available on tea time with tester website and we will make a public announcement once we upload it there. Well, that's me, Lalit Bambai. I'm working with one large investment bank as test analyst and I also look after Titan with Tester as its chief editor and co-founder. Apart from my regular job of software testing, I also teach software testing in my at my workplace. We have Joel Montveliski as a guest host and facilitator today. Joel is with Practitest and working as Chief Solution Architect there. Joel is also an author behind a popular software testing blog known with uh, QA Intelligence. And time to introduce our star panelist. We are glad to have Jerry Weinberg with us. Jerry Weinberg is highly respected and well-known figure in the field of computer software. He is a prize-winning author of over 80 books, international consultant, speaker, teacher, and he has also founded AYE Conference. You can know more about Jerry and his work on his website, geraldmbenberg.com. We also have Fiona Charles on panel today. Fiona is well-known software test consultant, teacher, conference speaker, writer. She has over 30 years of experience in software development and integration with multiple domains. And she is also co-founder and host of Toronto Workshop on software testing. You can know more about Fiona on qualityintelligence.com and can also follow her on Twitter. And now I will let Joel do the talking. So Joel, I'm just passing on control to you. Okay. And studio. thank you. Just one second. To be myself organized as well. Okay. Um, so as Lid said, um, There we go. Um, as Lid said, um, what we want to do today basically is to do a review over um, the state of testing survey. And so I want to start first of all by giving a little bit of an introduction about uh, this, this survey and exactly what we try to do. The state of testing survey, it's a, an idea that came from both Tea Time with Testers as well as uh, from, from my blog, where we really wanted to get a, a kind of a subjective as much as possible view of what is going on on the testing world today. And so around December 2013, we published this survey. It ran for a number of weeks, and we got uh, hundreds of, of uh, answers from all over the world. The results were published on February 2014, and the idea is that we will continue running this survey once a year, basically to understand how stuff is changing and to get an up-to-date perception of what's going on on the world of testing. Okay. Now, what we want to do, we took a couple of, of the stuff, the things that we actually got out of this uh, survey, and we thought that it would be very interesting just to review him with uh, uh, Jerry and Fiona as well. So we want to start with, with one of the first uh, points that actually were brought up, and that is a point where one of the things that we're seeing, or at least we thought of, is uh, the perception of testing as a profession. Okay, and one of the main things that we've been seeing worldwide whenever you talk to other people is that in the past at least, we felt that testing was um, 
sort of as a stepping stone into other fields of the development and IT fields. Okay, and one of the things that we saw, or at least we were a little bit surprised to see, is that most of the testers that answer the survey are not in the first, second, or third years of, of their testing experience. They're most towards their thirds and all the way to 11th years of their testing experience, showing that, okay, people are not really stepping over testing to move over other things, but they're actually staying more in the testing fields. Another thing that we saw it's that a lot of people are not switching over many organizations, but staying in one organization. Um, so what we wanted to see, and again, it's a question maybe, Jerry, you can start with it, is are we seeing a gradual change in this perception, or um, is, how is this reflected on the day-to-day -day work of the testers globally? Well, I don't think, uh, I think we have to be careful about how we interpret these data. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, we know that the way we gather this information doesn't give a random sample across all testers. The ones who have been around less than a year are not so likely to be uh, looking in the places where we advertise this survey. So I'd, you know, I'd say they're probably more in the less than a year category than show here. But still, uh, the important thing is there's a lot of people in, more than three years in testing. And uh, I'd ask you what your expectations are um, as far as a career is concerned. Now, three years is not a very long time, actually. I mean, I've been over 50 years in the business. And at the end of three years, uh, I was just starting out. Now, maybe people think uh, after three years, they ought to be promoted to be the, the president of the company or something. I, I think that's unreasonable. Uh, that being said, I think uh, some years spent in software testing is the best possible preparation for moving to other jobs if you want to, uh, if you want to. And there's just absolutely uh, nothing wrong with staying in software testing for your whole career uh, if, if you want to, except maybe uh, the positions are not available, uh, the rewards are not so available. So we, we will have to look at that in future surveys. But I think uh, this actually represents a fairly healthy situation right now. Uh, people have some job security. They can go to work for a company. Uh, they're not just hired to test in one project and then gotten rid of. Uh, they, they can come, stay in a job for a while, and learn a whole lot and prepare themselves for whatever else they want to do uh, because testing is the number one place to learn about the whole software development business. That's the end. Okay. Uh, Fiona, what do you think about this? Uh, how, how actually are, can you interpret the numbers that we're seeing here? Well, like Jerry, I think there's, there's a certain amount of selection bias here uh, in the people who responded to the survey in the first place. So it's, so it's kind of hard to, to know how to interpret the data. Um, I'm a little bit dubious about the perception of testing as a profession here as a statement uh, rather than perhaps the perception of testing as a career. Um, profession has a quite specific meaning as far as I'm concerned which is not necessarily the same thing as, as a career choice. But um, I think it's very interesting. I, actually, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the, in the perception that uh, in the past, testing was considered by some as a stepping stone, because yes, that was true for some. But testing has been a, a pretty reasonable career choice for quite a while. So I'm not sure whether we're seeing a change or not. And, and I am also not sure how you correlate your, your years testing graph with your company's work as a tester. Uh, is there any correlation, say, between the three to five year group and the two to three organization group, or, or is there no correlation at all? Um, well, I can actually tell you because I, I did do a little bit of a, of a deep down check in there, and I, I was amazed to see that there wasn't. I mean, we, we were seeing a very low correlation between people who are jumping around and the years of experience. I was expected to see that people who were on the 6 to 10 or 11 years, they were on the 5 to 9 organizations. Obviously, there were a little bit more, but 
but it was not very, um, let's say, uh, shifted or tilted towards that part of the, of the graph. Right. So, so it was a little bit. Sorry, Joel. If you look at how, okay. how testers are employed, you know, there are at least three kinds of options that I can think of. There are testers who, who are, are in-house, if you like, who work on a variety of projects as they come up, or in fact work in sort of regular operations. There are testers who work for consulting companies where they get experience across a broad range of clients, uh, and there are testers who are indep independent. So again, uh, it's hard to, to understand what the data is actually telling us here. Okay, fair enough. And, and as I said before, and as Jerry also place it in there. One of the main things that we want to do with the survey basically is to learn from the results that we got from the answers that we're getting from the first survey and obviously continue uh, working towards that. So maybe on the next or, or even the survey after that we will be able to plot a little bit more and to see if there are any changes or maybe ask more correlating uh, questions about about that. Okay, Gary, yes. anything else to add? Yeah, I think that uh, one way to look at the survey is that uh, it's a um, more getting information about what information we should be getting. So it's a preparation for next year's survey and the one after that. I mean, there's a lot of useful stuff here, but we're also seeing that we'd like to be able to answer some other questions in addition. And I hope that the participants will submit uh, questions they have that maybe they see are not answered by the uh, by the survey results or other questions they'd like to see added to the survey in the future. So oh. that would, that's another way to look at, at what we've got here. And, and yeah. that's definite. I mean, one of the things that we understood is that uh, we're only starting to understand what we need to ask. Okay, and we've already gotten a lot of feedback on, on additional questions or maybe on how to define the questions a little bit better to get more, uh, basically better answers. And yes, this is, this is a, uh, as, as most testing exercises go, this is a learning experience as well. So we're happy with this one. Okay, so um, let's switch over to our next point. And um, the next point basically is going over again, uh, learning and, and the professional developers of the testers. And one of the things that we asked, and we were not very surprised by this, is that we understand that most testers use self-learning or on-the-job training in order to learn their testing. And we can see these on the left side of, of the graph that we have in here. Most people are self-taught or they're on-the-job training. But we also see that this is not something that changes as people become more professional. I mean, still people are using test, uh, testing books and uh, online communities and magazines, stuff like that, in order to continue learning. Now, going again over the profession or, or um, Again, our, our, our jobs as testers, how does this compare to the jobs of our peers? I mean, we're all the time working with programmers or analysts or people who actually went and got a computer science degree or something equivalent in order to do their jobs. And on the other hand, us as testers who actually come from an e-self-learning perspective, how does this affect us? I Meaning, is this something that it's in our favor against us? And, and obviously, what can we do about it, if at all? Um, Fiona, maybe you, we can start with you and, and your, your feedback on this. It's a really interesting question. I, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, when I, when I started in IT, and I, I actually started as a technical writer in 1978, the major, in fact, nearly all of the programmers I knew were people who came from a, a huge variety of other disciplines and uh, to a large extent were almost self-taught. Um, their computer science programs were relatively young then. And, and it's only in the last, oh, I don't know, 20 odd years that, that we're seeing where the majority of programmers and analysts come out of computer science degrees. And I have to say that having worked on software projects over that time consistently, what I have seen is an increasing narrowing in how and how programmers and analysts approach soft, the development of software, I think there are some real benefits in the in the increased technical training, but I think there are some downsides 
in, in uh, I hesitate to say lack of imagination because I think that's really pejorative, but, but that I don't see some of the same level of empathy from, from computer science graduates, uh, empathy with, with customers that I saw when, when they came from a variety of backgrounds. And, and many, many technical people develop that empathy over time. But um, I wonder if that is, if the, the difference in, in the education of testers and, and programmers doesn't in fact give us an edge in terms of our ability to relate to the people that we're developing software for. I don't, you know, I can't prove that, but I also think it's a very important part of our job to be able to have that empathy and to be able to represent the interests of, of the, the stakeholders that we're developing the software for. Uh, so I don't, I don't see the, the way we learn to test as necessarily having a, a major downside at all. I think that, uh, that there's a lot of, of value in the kinds of, of ways that we go about it. Now, obviously on-the-job training has, can have a, a tremendously variable uh, quality. Um, it can, it can, can consist of being given a template and told to fill it out. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people put in that position. Or, in fact, it can consist of, of challenging, uh, being given challenging projects and being mentored through those projects. So there's tremendous variability here. But on the whole, I'm, I'm not sure we're in a bad position. Okay. Um, Jerry, what do you think about this? Well, Fred, I'm, I'm looking at this graph, and uh, I think we, we have to do something about the way the questions are asked. Because <coughs> um, I would have thought that uh, the on-the-job training would be 100%, because I can't imagine doing a job as a tester and not learning something new every day. Um, you know, so who are these 25% of the people who are working as testers and who are not learning anything about testing from doing it? Uh, I mean, it's inconceivable to me. Now, maybe Joel is maybe something the way the question was asked. Um, and maybe on the follow-up uh, uh, tests, uh, the follow-up survey for next year, we might ask more specific things like how many of you have read uh, a book on testing in the past year, uh, things like that, uh, because just I, I think the usefulness here is in the third and fourth category, uh, is whether you've taken a certification or whether you've taken a f uh, formal course, those are fairly well defined. and. Um, those numbers are, um, I, I don't worry about them being too small. I, I don't have a lot of confidence in uh, formal training in testing um, and in the certifications that exist. I think uh, any reasonably bright person uh, in a few months of working as a tester will pick up pretty much everything. Uh, that these courses can cover, especially introductory courses. Um, I can see uh, people learning uh, new specialized techniques or learning new tools uh, as being useful, but there are so many different tools that I don't think, uh, like if you take a course in the university, uh, if it's about tools, they're not going to be the tools you're using on the job. Uh, at least that's that's my impression from what I've seen. Maybe you guys have seen something different. So the learning that you want is to learn a diversity of tools and learn things about how to tell what's a good tool or not, which things to ignore, um, which you know because if you just paid attention to the advertising for different tools, you you really would be misled as far as what it takes to test software. And uh, if we'd like to know where specifically people are getting this uh, formal training and what it consists of, 
but right now it's not a very big part of, of what people are doing and as far as I'm concerned that's okay. I would like to see the on-the-job training be up to 100%. Uh, I'd, li I'd like people to be doing, we find out if people are doing things like whether they have a reading group at work. See, Joel, I don't know uh, if you, some of the test groups that I work with, they have a regular uh, program where they get together several times a week and they read the same book, and they'll read a chapter and they'll discuss it and they'll try to apply it to their work. Where would this fit in the survey? Oh, well, I think that this is, this is mostly on the ongoing testing education and, and I would think at least I would place it under the testing books and blogs category on, on the right hand uh, graph in there. Uh, and, and I think that we did even, our, our emphasis was on trying to understand two things. And it was on the first part, okay, so you got to become a tester in the first place. How did you actually get to that? How was your first year? Okay, during the first year where you went from um, darkness to light, let's say, and all of a sudden you realize that pushing buttons is not going to cover it. You need to do a little bit more than that. So how did you learn that? And, and many people, uh, at least from what I, I understand on the job training was, well, they told me, go ahead and test, and, and I basically just learn from my box and learn from the stuff that I just took out or, or someone came and taught me. Now the second part is it's maybe more interesting and it's also something that it's uh, related to a question that it's, it's placed in here, meaning how should a tester today, and let's take into account that the world today is totally different than it was 10 or 5 years ago with the internet and community and stuff like that, how should a tester today continue growing? And then what are the tools, what are the recommended stuff that we should tell everyone, hey, go ahead and in order to become a better tester or continue improving your testing methodologies and techniques, do this. What would, and again, Jerry, you and also Fiona, what would you recommend those testers, maybe not the beginner ones, it's more challenging for someone who has been doing this for five, six or ten years to continue improving the way that you work. How would, what would you recommend, Jerry? Fiona, you could first, you go first. Well, I look at the, the, the variety of things that you've, that you've put in this, in this box, and I say, do them all. Um, I, I, I have trouble imagining a tester who is not learning constantly. So that, I, and, and there are so many things that contribute to your education. Uh, you have to, I think, stay in touch with testing books and blogs and, and online communities and forums and so on because, uh, because the field is changing. Because there are new ideas because the technologies change and so on. I mean, suddenly, uh, you know, people need to learn about mobile, for example. <laughs> but uh, would you weight these things? No, I don't think I would. Uh, formal courses, for example, there, there, there is a huge range of formal courses in testing. For, and, and what do we call a formal course? Is that something where you sit for three days and you have a drive-by course, or is it something where you do hands-on? Um, some of them are abysmal, and some of them are wonderful. So, you know, I can't say go, go and take a course. Um, but certainly you need to keep up, and you need to, to understand uh, that there are, there are ranges of thinking in testing. And you need to be aware of what, those, those, what is represented uh, in those ranges and in those so-called testing schools, and, and understand what, what it is that, that people are doing, and, and how what they what each group is doing can help you become a better tester. Okay. okay. Say more than that. Well, <laughs> uh, I com I completely agree with that. Uh, in looking at this classification, I say number one, <clears throat> I can't imagine <clears throat> someone who's working as a tester and, and doesn't subscribe to at least one testing magazine especially since uh, at least one of them is absolutely free. And if you're not interested enough in your job to, uh, to subscribe to a free testing magazine, either there's something wrong with you or something wrong with the magazine. And uh, I uh, personally don't think there's any, anything wrong with uh, tea time for testers, uh, which every tester ought to subscribe to, or there may be other magazines that they would prefer, but 
uh, the, I mean, there's just no excuse. They're going to say, well, my company won't pay for it. Uh, you can't say that. Um, same way with uh, online communities and forums. Uh, they don't charge the ones that I know. Uh, some of them charge. I used to run one where there was a slight charge to keep out uh, spammers, but um, there's no reason not to belong to something like that. And if you belong to one and it doesn't seem useful, then you leave it and go join up with a different one. Um, those are all there and available to you. You don't have to get permission of your boss. Uh, Although um, some bosses I know uh, punish testers that because they see them reading a book on the job, uh, that that's not good. Um, but it should be a hundred percent. You you personally, I'm talking to each of you in the audience. Each of you, if you don't subscribe to a testing magazine now, then within an hour after you leave this webinar, you should sign up for some testing magazine. Uh, you should also join some testing online community, at least one. Um, and maybe uh, sign up for a blog. Uh, and we look closer to 100%, but you lump blogs and books together. I would like to see that separated in the next survey. Because I write books and I also have a blog, I'd like to know which one people pay more attention to. Um, I'm not worried by testing conferences and seminars um, being less than 50 percent because, um, again, they, some are very good and some are not. And the kind of thing I recommend to testers as far as education is concerned is not specialized courses for testers, but instead courses in better communicating better to people, uh, being better at problem solving, uh, general skills like that, um, rather than uh, particular testing skills, because you're doing that on the job and you can learn from that on the job. But the other things I see. Uh, most testers that I know are insufficiently trained in communication skills. They don't know how to write even a good report of a bug they found. Um, they don't know how to talk about these things that are difficult to talk about because people generally don't want to hear that they have bugs in their software. Uh, but that's your job. So I, I think we want in the future to separate the kind of conferences and seminars that people are going to uh, to find out more about about this because it just covers too much. Uh, I, I find the weekend testing is very uh, very interesting category and I'd like to see more of that. Uh, but I, I hope that you explained what that was, Joel. Uh, I'm not sure everybody understands that. Um, well, if, if people didn't understand and, and after this session, then they don't go on and even search on the internet, then I think that they're missing a lot of what testing is about, of, of learning what you have in the context. But uh, yes, and again, um, these are all very uh, good things to pinpoint. And uh, I don't know if any of the people who are here also follow. There's a very good discussion going around right now on Twitter. I remind you, go ahead and use the hashtag for state of testing, and there's uh, a very nice uh, discussion going over there, including weekend testing and, and the conferences in there. Um, for sure. What's the hashtag again? State of testing, one word, and and you will see people are right now talking a lot about that, and it's a very very ongoing discussion about that. By the way, okay. one of the things that I I managed to capture out of that is that someone actually said that he does most of his uh, or a, a part of his learning uh, basically from going to buy sandwiches and talking about testing with other people, I think that's a, it's an incredible way of putting it. Meaning a lot of things that we do learn about testing, learn about our products, we actually do it while not really paying attention to it. Okay? And we do it because we're professionals, I think, and, and we're always talking with our peers and learning stuff because it's something that interests us. Okay? So again, I, I suggest go ahead and, and take a look into that.
I well, I think I think this relates this very important point you're making, and I think it relates to uh, I'm not, uh, what I think is the next uh, question in the survey, or maybe maybe it's one more. I think it's the next question. So, uh, what other kinds of things do you do as part of your job? Because um, managing the testing that. group and uh, working on uh, customer support or working on requ uh, requirements, uh, all are places to learn important things about testing. And uh, so maybe we should move to that slide. There, well, there it is. Okay. Uh, can, I, yeah. can I just add one thing? Um, to one, the of the things, one? one of the things that I really encourage people to do besides all of these things is is to seek out projects that are going to going to teach you new skills uh, and give you the opportunity to perhaps learn about new products but but also to to learn different kinds of testing um, find people you want to work with and learn from okay that's that's a nice place to put it and and again something that uh, if, if we're on the part of, of suggesting uh, stuff to do uh, one of the things that I think that has at least personally helped me on my testing career is to learn stuff. And Jerry mentioned a little bit when he talked about communication. One of the best ways to te to learn testing is to learn stuff that might not really be related to the testing you're doing. Okay, and it might be communication skills. Um, it might be uh, writing. I think that a lot of testers don't know how to write. And when you don't know how to communicate your ideas, then you're not doing a good job. And one of the things that at least I've seen in a lot of places testers need to learn a little bit more of technical skills. So even if you just go and, you know, you don't need to go to formal course, you can just sit one, with one of your developers and say, hey, explain to me what you're doing. Walk me over the code, explain to me how I can write that and read that. That's also something that you can just go ahead and learn and it's very easy to do because, well, everyone actually knows it on, on the company. People are more than willing to share that with you. So I think that we should learn how to learn, basically. And that should be. And, uh, along that line, one more thing. The biggest thing about your learning, the biggest choice that you make, is what job you take. If you are in a job, when you, you look at yourself and say, every few months, you say, Am I, did I learn anything in the last few months? Did I learn a lot or did, did I not learn very much? And if you're not learning on a job, get a different job. That because is, if on the job learning is the major source, then you don't want to be in a job that doesn't contribute to your learning. Um, and I've advised many, many individuals that they're in the wrong job. Uh, they wake up in the morning and you think about, it, what am I going to learn today? What did I learn yesterday? And if it's not there, then you're in the wrong place. Uh, you're not going to go anywhere, whether you want to stay as a tester or whether you want to move on to some other uh, career. Uh, if you're not learning every day, then you're not doing the right thing. Amen. Period. <laughs> I can sign on that one. Okay, so let, let's transition into the next one. And it, it's a little bit related, as, as Jerry was saying. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to see, uh, many times whenever we talk informally to testers, they are always telling us how they do a lot of things that it's not related to quote-unquote testing. I mean, it's not related to going and exploring the system or going and, and, and checking the system for, for uh, functionality and bots. And so we wanted to understand what people are doing. And, and so we saw a lot of things, for example, uh, many people almost have are saying that they're in, in charge of the environments, I meaning the testing environment, the development environment, they're in charge of that. A lot of people are doing requirements gathering, integrations and deployments. Something that is at least personally very, very nice to see is that a lot of testers are doing customer support and professional servers uh, services. So the question here is, okay, are these, why are testers doing these extra activities? Meaning, is it because uh, we have a lot of spare time? Is it because it's something that it's very natural that we do it? And also, meaning, how can these activities either help or harm you as a tester? Um, Jerry, maybe you want to start with that one? Uh, let Fiona start. Okay. If you want to. I don't see how any anything related to software development can harm you as a tester. 
I think you, you just as, as you said, you're acquiring some what you call technical skills, what I might call coding skills, uh, is, is only going to help you understand more about how software is, is developed in the first place um, and perhaps help you get inside it. Uh, just about all of these things are in some way going to help you. I, managing, managing, is that managing the development environment or is it actually managing development? No, we, we ask mostly about the environments. I mean, yeah. developers need to integrate somewhere and they need to test it somewhere. So testers were actually in charge of that. I, I actually find it extremely difficult. On, I, I tend to work on, on very large projects and in, in, in quite conservative organizations quite often where the test team is not allowed to manage its own environment and that is incredibly frustrating and not very mm -hmm. helpful. Uh, you have to wait for someone else to do it. So, so I think the more people who can do that, the better. Um, because you want control over your environment. You want to understand what your environment is and what it has. Uh, managing, uh, gathering requirements, I think, is, is a wonderful place for a tester to be. How many testers do I hear at just about every conference I go to, except perhaps the context-driven ones, where, where people are, are yammering about how awful the requirements they get are? Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and seeking to lay blame and uh, complaining that, that excellent requirements are not handed to them on a platter. Well, great. Go out there and, and help in the, in the gathering process. Um, go out there and ask the questions that you need to ask early on. I think that's a wonderful thing. Integration and deployments, again, you need to understand how... how now, <coughs> pardon me. I'm not sure what, what integration means here. Uh, it could mean integration testing as well. And, and clearly that's, that's extremely important, but, but you have to understand how, how software, software that people are going to use is deployed. Customer support, as you, as you said, Joel, I think is also wonderful. You need to understand who's going to be using the software, how they use it, and what issues they're encountering with it. So I don't know what, what, what's there in the other. Um, where, where I get frustrated with quote, extra activities is when testers are being dragged into meetings that, that have nothing to do with the, the projects that they're working on or, um, you know, have a lot, of, a lot of administrative busy work that is not contributing to, to the development of software. But anything, I think, that, that helps contribute, that helps testers be part of a team and helps them be accepted parts of the team and, and, and provides learning opportunities for them, I think is wonderful. Uh, let me build on that. Um, first of all, one of the things, if you work in an organization where testers are not involved in the requirements gathering, then that's something that requires fixing in the organization. And you should be working to get that fixed. If you can't, then that's a good sign you should be working somewhere else uh, because <laughs> aside from ambiguous requirements and things of that sort, uh, most of the requirements that I see coming from developers and salespeople are not testable. They're not a basis for testing something. You know, I mean, if somebody says uh, this should be fast, it should be portable, it should be blah, blah. And what does that mean? What is, if you're testing, what is it you look for when those things are said? Um, and what you're doing when you're testing, looking at the big picture, you are trying to find places where the software is suitable for use or not suitable for use. In order to do that, you have to know about how it's used, right? Uh, you, you can guess about how it's used, and, and many, many of the things we test are used in very special environments and uh, we know nothing about. I mean, if uh, you're building software, I had a client who was building software for breeding animals, and uh, the people working on this had no idea what was involved in breeding animals, and there, so nobody in the place had, had any idea of whether their tests made any sense at all. Uh, if you're involved in requirements gathering, that might give you some sense. If you go out and actually uh, participate in the installation and the deployment of, a, of the software somewhere, uh, that gives you some sense, of, especially what people have, a lot of the problems they were testing for have to do with 
just installing the software and getting people using it at all. Uh, you can't learn that just by studying the software. You have to be out there where it's being used. And customer support is such a great place that I always advise my clients that everyone in testing, and also the people in development, but it's certainly more obvious in testing, should spend uh, one day or two days uh, every month on the telephone doing customer support uh, as part of their job of learning to be a good tester and, and to test the specific kind of software that that we're doing. Um, where else would you know what's really important to people? You know, we can't, one of the things you learn quickly in the testing business is you can't test everything, right? People are always saying, you should just test everything. You have to make choices as to where to put your effort. It, where you should put your effort is where it's important to your customer. And uh, you have to know how they use it and which parts are most important. Uh, which are used more, which are most critical that they be exactly correct. Uh, how else would you learn that Ex except to be either out in the field uh, installing the software or on the phone hearing what people are having trouble with. So these are not um, extra activities. To me, uh, everything listed here, except for other, I don't know what other means, but everything listed here are parts of the tester job and parts of the tester job description. If they're not part of your job description, then you should be working in your organization to get your job description changed so that you spend a certain amount of your time doing customer support, that you participate in uh, installation uh, of software uh, or upgrading of software. You're out there with your customers and your users that you participate at the front end in requirements gathering, reviewing requirements, and of course, as Fiona says, uh, it's inconceivable that you have somebody else managing your environment for testing. I mean, who else could possibly do that job well? But if you've got somebody uh, who does not understand testing, who is managing your testing environment, no wonder you have trouble getting uh, some software you need, some training you need, some hardware you need, some time for one thing or another. Uh, if this is not part of your job description, then you, when you leave this workshop, start working to get it part of your job description. Period. Okay, guys. Uh, great advice. Uh, let's let's move a little bit forward. Where actually time is running out, and I think we have a lot of other stuff to. So here and basically from our um, pre um, webinar session I know this is going to be a, a later slide um, okay so we had to ask this and how are how are people working out there and this might be a question that is not directly related or only related to testing it's mostly related to the place where we actually live and that is in the software development life cycle and we asked how are people actually working, what software developer models are people using. And what we saw, it's an astounding, almost 80% of people saying, hey, we're working agile or agile-like. Okay, and by agile and agile-like, we also saw people who are saying agile bots and all sorts of scrum and stuff like that. But people self-declared themselves or their companies working agile-like. We also see people who are working in, in a multitude of ways. I mean, you can see there's an overlap between agile and waterfall, for example, and stuff like that. And we also see people who are saying, hey, 12% of people are saying, we don't follow any structure, model, stuff like that. Um, what's the, what does it mean? Meaning, focusing only on Agile, is Agile our holy grail? Um, are we there yet? Is it that, on the one hand? And on the other hand, people who don't follow any structure module, should they be actually looking for other places to work because it's lost cost? Um, Jerry, what do you think about this? Well, it's very simple. I'm sure Fiona will say the same thing. Uh, I find this part of the survey uh, meaningless um, because people will say right now the magic word is agile and so if you ask what they're doing they'll say we're doing agile or agile like 
if you look at what they're doing as a real tester does, right? I mean, that's what we do. We test things. We don't take people's word for it. I mean, people hand you a piece of software and say, oh, it's okay. You don't need to test it. It doesn't have any bugs. Would you believe that? Well, you wouldn't, of course. But why would you believe when they say we're doing agile-like software development? I mean, uh, that could mean anything. And over the years, I've seen that whatever the latest fad is, people will claim to be doing it or doing something just like it or uh, whatever. So rather than try to categorize like this, the question I would like to ask testers is, do you know what your developers do? Uh, number one, do they do the same thing consistently? Uh, and number two, what is it that they do? So for example, uh, we ask them about technical reviews, which is a very important part of testing. And I get people who tell me, oh, we do technical reviews. And I say, what do you review? And they say, oh, we review almost everything. And it turns out, and then I say, what do you mean almost everything? Which things don't you review? It turns out the things that they have the most trouble with in testing, in support, are the things that, where they skip that step in their supposed process. So the important thing for a tester is to know what is it that people actually do. Just the same way you need to know a piece of software. What is it the software actually does, not what it claims to do? And then if you know what they actually do, you generally speaking, you'll find that they are not doing certain things that you know would make testing easier to do, testing more profitable to do, and you can work as a tester to get the actual process changed, not the process description. Process is not the same as a process description. People describe all kinds of things they do, like if you go to the dentist, and they'll ask you, you know, I was at the dentist this morning, and said, do you floss your teeth? And I said, yes. Right? Well, sometimes I floss my teeth, right? Uh, that isn't really what a dentist wants to know. If you say, do you, you, do you, you do unit testing? And they'll say, oh, yes, of course we do that. Well, what does it mean to them? Uh, I was at a place recently where what unit testing means is if the program compiles without serious errors from the compiler, then it's unit tested. And uh, working with that definition is very different from what I would consider unit testing. So rather than uh, pay attention to what they say they're doing, like in the survey, I would like you to pay attention to what you're doing to find out what they're really doing, period. OK. Um, Fiona, what do you think about uh, about uh, this point? Do you agree do you, uh, on, on the fact that people might be calling Agile anything? And, and what exactly, do you know what? Let me position this a little bit different. Regardless if we call it Agile or if we call it iterative or if we call it fast development, because one of the things that we're seeing right now is that we're developing software a lot faster, even because it's SaaS or, or all sorts of, of other reasons. Our test, uh, is our work as testers or whatever trend that is going on right now, has it made the work of the tester better? Has it made the status of the tester within our teams better? What do you think about that? Well, why does the status of a tester matter um, to some extent? That's something we've been whining about for a long time. You know, oh, poor us, we're second class citizens. Uh, does that matter? I think what matters is is that we do good work and we have uh, we work in organizations that make it possible for us to do good work that is that is actually valuable to what's going on. Um, I wanted to, and I'm, by the way, I do absolutely agree with, with what Jerry said. Like, you know, what's the holy grail? I don't believe in holy grails. I've I've seen one religion after another sweep through software development. Every one of them contributes something. And and what we often find over time is that the good things get passed, uh, become part of the culture, become part of what good organizations do when they develop software, what good teams do. So for example, I think that what 
what we I hope we will see coming out of Agile when, when the next religion sweeps through is is uh, smaller increments of, of, of software development and, and, and more frequent iteration uh, rather than great big bangs of software. And, and I think that it has been demonstrated that we get better software that way. If we get better software that way, I hope that that, that contributes to making the work of a tester easier. Um, and, and that, but there are agile teams out there that say they don't want testers. They don't, they don't see a need for professional testers. And it may be that they don't, that they don't need them. And that's something I think we also need to look at. So, you know, when you look at this, um, when we talk about the status of a tester, there's an implicit assumption there that uh, every team has to have a tester, that, that, that testing done by people whose role is, is to be a tester uh, is essential on every, on every project. And that may not be true. That may not be true for uh, freeware, for example, for uh, software that, that is very low risk. So, so it's more about what I said earlier that I think that, that we have the opportunity to do good work and work that is valuable. And, and to help to, to produce excellent software. I didn't answer your question, sorry. <laughs> no, but you actually brought some very good points. So it's, I think that you'll get a, a, a pass on that at this point. Um, okay. Jerry, anything else to, uh, please. Uh, anything else to, to add to this at this point, Jerry? Well, I'll just quote uh, some people have read me quoting this before. Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and his favorite riddle, he would ask people, he said, if, if you call a, a tail, if you say that a tail is a leg, how many legs does a dog have? And the answer to the riddle is four, because calling it a leg doesn't make it a leg. And calling it agile doesn't make it agile. Calling it tested doesn't make it tested. Calling it user-friendly doesn't make it user-friendly. Calling it anything doesn't make it that. In too many places I see this name magic, you call it, substituted for real professional testing. So as a tester, what you want to learn to do is to catch people believing that if they call something with a magic name, then somehow magic happens. And then they get ideas like, oh, we don't need to test, or uh, things like that. I've literally heard people say, I'm sure Fiona has heard this, Joel has heard this, uh, well, we're doing agile, we don't need testing. Right? Uh, this is uh, ridiculous. I mean, if we may not need testing, as Fiona says, but as a separate function, but that's only if we build software in a certain way. We're testing all along as we go along. And just saying it is testing doesn't make it testing. So we have to be very careful in, in surveying these things that we realize what people are doing when they answer the question. OK? okay. Uh, and I hope that the next iteration uh, allows us you know, to look at more specific practices um, like do you build, you know, in, in what size increments do you build software in your organization? Uh, oh, we, we're doing Agile and we build in 12-month intervals, you know, and then you know that it's ridiculous. Okay. Well, I'm preaching, but that's really <laughs> important stuff. Point taken, point definitely taken. Okay, we don't have a lot of time, and this is also a, a question that we ask, and, and actually the results were a little bit uh, eye-opening. We ask people if they're concerned about their career as a tester, okay? And the numbers that we got uh, were a little bit disconcerting. Um, about 40% said they're not concerned, cool. But if we look at it, the rest of them, and that's close to 60%, they were either somewhat concerned or very concerned. Um, what does it mean? Does it mean something specifically for testers? Does it mean, is it maybe we're talking here about a, a trend in the technical world right now where people are talking about second or third bubble, stuff like that. What do you make of this? 
especially if we look into the, the first part, the first question that we ask, the, uh, that we open this discussion about where people have been working in Tester for six, seven, eight, ten, eleven years. I mean, what, how can we read this part of the, what people are saying? Um, Jerry, go ahead. All right. Well, you know, a few years ago, <coughs> I was very sick. You know, I had uh, very serious cancer. And I'm very glad that um, they found this in the, during their tests. But before that, um, I was not very uh, interested in medical tests. I thought, you know, they they take they're painful. They take a lot of time. They interrupt you, and so on. So I didn't have so much value for uh, medical testing. I see the same thing in software, I, and if I'm working and my whole job was in testing and that was the career I wanted, I would be concerned. I'm, I'm more concerned about the 42% who are not concerned because uh, nowadays people are like I was before I got seriously sick. Uh, I wasn't concerned. Uh, I, I didn't think medical testing was that important. Uh, it was like medical insurance I didn't think was that important. Why are make people making such a fuss about it? Well, if I didn't have the medical insurance, I would have gone bankrupt because of my sickness. So now I value medical insurance and medical testing very much. Right? But in the software business, there's way, way, way too many people building software who just think of testing as a nuisance. It's just something they need to avoid, work around in some way. And so if you're working as a tester, you need to be concerned about that. Uh, if you don't value what you're doing, uh, you're not going to get rewarded for what you do. And you won't have a lot of job security and so on. So it should be a big part of your concern to uh, part of your job is to help people to understand how important it is what you do. Not just by saying, oh, I do something very important, but by having examples to show them what happens when you test well, what happens when you don't test well, what it costs. Uh, and you have to learn how to do this, and then we could be less concerned about the future of testing. But right now, my concern is that people are not as concerned as they ought to be. Period. Okay. Uh, Fiona, because we don't have a lot of time, I, I want to focus on the last thing that Jerry said. And he said that we should be concerned on, on helping people make them understand why, why our job actually adds value. So let me ask you a question. Why does our job add value? I mean, as a tester, maybe not a tester with a lot of experience, how can I help my management understand the value that we're bringing as, uh, as a team, as a testing function within the, the, the development team? It's a really large question, um, but par part of the simple answer is is what Jerry said about insurance. That's what testing is. It is insurance, and and there are cases in which you need more or less insurance. But if you're working in an industry where there's where there's a ser serious degree of software risk, where um, software failures can cause real harm, whether that's financial loss or or um, risks to, to life and health, uh, or a myriad of other, of other serious risks, uh, testing, testing done well, provides you with insurance. It doesn't guarantee that you're, you're not going to release your bugs, or in fact, that you're not going to release with important bugs, but it helps to mitigate that risk. And, and that, I think, is, is how we how we demonstrate that value. But, but I want to go back to what I just said, which is testing done well. Um, there are still a lot of people out there who treat testing as a routine activity, who don't grow their skills, <laughs> who uh, docu you know, spend, spend their lives doing terribly detailed test scripts um, and that, that don't allow them to, to grapple properly with the software and to explore the software properly and, and look for bugs. Uh, not all testers are good testers. And, and I think that, that 
the best way we can we can persuade people of the value of what we do is to do it well, to do it excellently. Okay. Amen. Amen. Also from Jerry, something else to add. Okay. Well, uh, I mean, yeah. What, what what Fiona said about insurance is a good model to use. Uh, I'd suggest that you know, testers. As part of their education, they learn about the insurance business. Uh, I've worked with a number of insurance companies, and um, I remember one uh, that did maritime insurance. They would insure ships and their cargoes, and they were having a hard time uh, establishing a good testing group, good testing practices, until I went to the president of the company and explained that what they were doing was insurance. and. Uh, they, how they would not insure a ship and its cargo unless their people went and inspected it uh, to see was it dangerous, was it stored in a dangerous way, would it explode, would it come loose and break things. Would it, and they would never imagine insuring a ship and its cargo without testing it. And once he understood that, he came down with very strong support for uh, financial support and emotional support for building their testing group and making it very professional. So uh, I think if you understand the insurance business and the logic of insurance, then you will understand the testing business much better. Like, as Fiona said, uh, certain things uh, you don't insure. I mean, like uh, I have uh, dishes that sometimes I break a dish. I don't have insurance on my dishes. Why? Because it's not that much at risk. You know, if I break a dish, which I do fairly often, you know, I just go buy another one and it costs me a dollar. And this is, if I had a very fancy museum quality dishware, you know, then I would do something to ensure that I didn't break a plate that was worth two hundred dollars. Right? And we have to learn how to do that. That's part of our job as testers, is how to see what deserves the level of testing that we're offering, and uh, what deserves more and what deserves less. And then we have to sell that, that knowledge of ours to the other people in the organization, period. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, uh, Jerry, and thank you very much, Fiona. Uh, we're already past the top of the hour. I want to thank the people who are still in the conference haven't actually signed out. I'm sure that you have other things to do. So just just to wrap it up, and um, first of all, thanks for 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 taking part, Fiona and, and Jerry, uh, Lalit also for for putting this uh, webinar together. Um, we know that we haven't gotten around to answer even the, the, the very beginning of the questions that you've been asking. We will try to answer these questions as part of Tea Time with Testers, so keep looking into the, uh, the magazine. As Jerry said, there's really no reason why you shouldn't subscribe to it. Okay, and I also want to thank all the tweets who have been tweeting all the time using state of testing hashtag. Um, we will go right now into state of testing and try to continue the conversation over there. So once again, thank you for everyone for joining and for being part of this uh, session. And uh, we hope to continue this conversation next year once we actually have the results of the next iteration of the State of Testing Survey. Um, Lalit, any last words? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm really humbled with the participation and, and the discussion that's going on Twitter. It, it has definitely made this uh, entire effort as a huge success and way, way too many cool than what I had imagined. So thank you everybody. Special thanks to Jerry and Fiona for your time. And we will speak soon about this. Or oh, watch out for my editorial incoming issue. Thank you so much everybody. Have a great time. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.